Hi everyone, what we're looking at here is a glass brownie pan and suspended above it I have a mini flashlight so this is projecting onto the top of my chest freezer here so we can see motion of this water just has a little blue food coloring in it projected onto the surface below. So let's take a look at what happens if I tap the surface of the water. We see below this circular pattern moving out from where I'm tapping. Notice if I tap repeatedly, these arcs never overtake each other, but let's try if we jostle just this way. I hope you can see that I'm getting waves, plane wave fronts, straight lines, that move through each other as we disturb the fluid. So this motion is called a wave, and we want to develop a model uh, that describes the qualities of this behavior that we see in nature. So let's take a look at how that works. So to understand the behavior we saw in the ripple tank, let's start with a simpler example. Suppose that I have two blocks that are firmly anchored, and in between those two blocks I stretch a string of uniform density. The string has length L, and its total mass we will call capital M. Now nothing's going to happen if we just leave the string there, so let's disturb it into a shape. And I'd like to develop some general intuition about how this is going to behave if we pluck it. So the idea I want to start with is that where the string is more kinked, where it has more curvature, uh, I think it will accelerate more. Where it's less curved, less acceleration when there's less curvature, and more acceleration when and where there is more curvature on the string. So in words we say that acceleration is proportional to curvature, and this symbol that looks like a broken infinity just means proportional to, so if I double the curvature it will produce double the acceleration, for example. Hearing that notation out of the way, we can simplify things a bit and break this string into a series of particles. The motivation for doing this is so that we can have a more algorithmic approach to understanding the wave equation that we develop. So let's break this string into 10 particles and imagine that they are connected by massless connectors that carry tension between them. We can label the positions of the 10 particles x0, y0 to x9, y9. And now I'd like to pick just one of those particles to study in more detail. So let's clear out the rest. Notice that what's going to happen to x4, y4 will be directly related to its nearest neighbors, x3 and x5, on the left and right. We can think of it as x sub i, y sub i, where i is just a, an address indicating which of the particles we're talking about. Now if this is particle xi, yi, then to its left is xi minus 1, yi minus 1, and xi plus 1, yi plus 1. So this notation will allow us to find a relationship that is generically true everywhere on the string. Let's zoom in on this particle a little bit. Now to understand this behavior we can add some right triangles here and think about the angle that is formed on each side. So we can call the angle on the left theta left and the angle on the right theta right. Let's assume for this string that theta left and theta right are both much less than one. One what? In this case we mean less than one radian. In that case cosine of theta right and cosine of theta left will be approximately equal to one. Let's take a look at a graph to understand that. Here we've graphed y equals one in blue and y equals cosine theta in red. And notice that in this region, say from negative 0.2 radians to positive 0.2 radians, these two curves are very close to each other. This is called the small angle approximation, often very useful in physics. So for these small amplitude disturbances, we can talk about cosine of theta, which relates to the horizontal component of the force on this particle and represents this side of the triangle. So if my hypotenuse is the tension T in the string, then this component here is the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta right. So here's my theta right. But we know that theta right and theta left are approximately equal to 1, and therefore approximately equal to each other. So if we sum the forces, applying Newton's second law here, taking the net force in the x direction, what we will have is tension times cosine of theta right, pulling to the right, minus tension cosine theta left, pulling to the left, where we're using the convention that right is positive and left is negative. Substituting in our small angle approximation, we see that this is t times 1 minus t times 1, which we know is zero. So this particle, according to our simplified model, is not going to accelerate left and right. So considering the sum of forces in the y direction, 
we're now looking at the opposite sides of the triangle. So we're thinking about, we're looking at small angles. So in this case, observe that if theta is much less than 1, then sine theta is approximately equal to theta. Here we have the canonical y equals x line, y equals theta in this case. And you can see that those two curves are very close to each other. So we say sine theta approximately equals theta. In this case, it's also useful to observe that there is another function that is approximately equal to these two functions, and that is tangent theta, which I have here in the orange dotted line. Why would we be interested in that? Well, let's take a look. Tangent, note, is the opposite over adjacent. So that is the rise over run. So this gives us a way to think about slope in relation to the force here. So let's substitute this relationship that sine theta approximately equals tan theta, and we'll plug that into our equation. Now making some space, tangent theta on the right is the ratio of delta y over delta x on the left. So we can figure out what these distances are for this particular particle if we know y sub i plus 1 and y sub i. Let's take a look at that. Making some more space again, notice that this distance here highlighted in pink, delta y on the right, is y sub i plus 1, the height of the particle to the right, minus y sub i, the height of our middle particle. We can substitute this into our equation here. and We have y of i plus 1 minus y sub i. Similarly, on the left-hand side, we're going to take the difference between the height of y sub i and the height of y sub i minus 1. So that looks like this. Now moving this equation up to make some more space for ourselves again, we can now start to think about what the left-hand side of the equation is also equal to. We know that the sum of forces in the y direction, the net force in the y direction, is equal to the mass of this middle particle, our point of focus, times its acceleration. So we can notate that as m sub i, the mass of the ith particle, times a y sub i, the acceleration of the ith particle. Let's take this highlighted equation. We'll move it up to the corner so we have more space to work again. So now we'd like to think about this m sub i. To how does it relate to the overall mass of our string, capital M, and its overall length, capital L? We can take a look and see that we can express that ratio, mass per length, as this quantity, which we'll call mu, the linear mass density. So if I buy some wire, and it weighs 10 grams per meter, that density is what's represented by this letter. Within these parentheses, we're thinking about the linear density times a small bit of length. So the mass of a small bit of length, say the mass of one particle in our chain, is mu delta x. We can divide both sides of this equation by mu delta x. Let's take a look at what that does for us. Now we have acceleration by itself. This is a good step because when I have an expression for acceleration, I can begin to make predictions for how things are going to change in time. Now consider what this orange highlighted quantity means. I see a change in y over a change in x, that's a slope, minus slope on the left, divided by the distance between those two slope segments. So this is the change in slope per unit length. That's the change in the change in height per unit length. This is the curvature of the string locally. It has the form we expect for a derivative, a second derivative, because we have a change in change here with our two deltas. So if we write this in derivative notation at the ith location, this is the second derivative of the height of the string with respect to distance along its length. More correctly, this is the change in space while keeping time a constant, so we should use, properly speaking, these partial derivative d's, which indicate this is the change in x when t is constant. Speaking of change in t, we can note on the left-hand side that acceleration is the change in velocity, which is the change in the change in position. So similarly, on this left-hand side, we have the partial derivative of the y component of velocity at location i with respect to time. And since velocity is the change in height, this is the second derivative at location i of y with respect to time. So this relates back to our initial guess, our initial supposition that the curvature in time is proportional to the curvature in space via this combination of multiplicative constants, the tension divided by the linear mass of the string. Clearing the top of our board and moving this equation up again, we can write this more compactly in this analytical form relating the second partial derivative with respect to time to the second partial derivative with respect to space, and this equation is the model that we call a wave. An entity that has this relationship 
Its curvature in time is proportional to its curvature in space. Although this is compact, we can expand it into a form that's more useful for integrating into a computer program. So let's see how that's done. But one last step before we do that, we want to think about what does this ratio, tension divided by mass density, mean? We'll notice whatever the units of y are, I have units of 1 over time squared, y over time squared, on the left. So if I want to end up with the same units on the right, after dividing by meters squared, dividing by length squared, I need to make up for that by multiplying by meters squared. And in order to end up with the time squared in the denominator, I need to divide by seconds squared. So this underbraced ratio has units of speed squared. We observed in the ripple tank that waves move at a constant speed. The ripples don't overtake each other. The speed depends on the medium. And we might guess that this is the wave speed. We can test that with some analytical examples when we implement this equation into code with some numerical examples. We often use the, speed, the symbol C for this wave speed. It stands for the Latin celeritas, which means swiftness or speed. Moving towards our algorithm, let's factor out our division twice by delta x squared. So we'll pull out these delta x's outside of the square braces to simplify this equation and end up with just our y points relating to each other inside, giving us this. Now notice that I'm subtracting y sub i twice, and if I distribute this negative onto this negative number, I'm actually taking positive the point on the right, positive the point on the left, minus twice the point in the middle. Simplifying that, we have y sub i plus 1 minus 2y sub i plus y sub i minus 1. So this combination of terms represents the local curvature of the string when we divide by our x spacing squared. Observing that this works for describing the curvature in space, we'd also like a dimension of time in this quantity y, which is a function of space and time. So let's add a second subscript. We're talking about location i, and we'll call time j. So i comma j means location i, time j. Here we have a point to the left of that in space, excuse me, to the right of that in space, but at the same time. We know that just as this right-hand side of the equation represents curvature in space, acceleration is the change in the change in y with respect to time. So if we take the same combination of left and right neighbors, but on our j indices instead of our i indices, we will have the expression for acceleration on the left. Let's implement that. Notice that when we take a time derivative, we're di dividing by delta t squared, and we're taking the same combination of positive the point on the right plus positive the point on the left minus 2 times the point in the middle. This is a three-point approximation for the curvature of a quantity, or the second derivative with respect to either the spatial index on the right or the time index on the left. We can now multiply by delta t squared on both sides so that we end up with a simpler expression on the left-hand side. I want to simplify the left-hand side because that will be more useful in my code. Our ultimate aim here is to predict the future. The future is the j plus 1 step in time. The present is step j, and the past is step j minus 1. So we want to isolate this term on the left-hand side. We can do that by simply adding 2y sub i j to both sides and subtracting y sub i comma j minus 1 from both sides, giving us this. So the height of the string at some future time at a location i depends on its current location, its location very recently in the recent past, and its curvature locally at the current time. So we have three times future, present, and past, and three spatial positions, right, center, and left. We can visualize these if we imagine storing our y information in an array. Here my array will have three rows and as many columns as I have points on my string. Dividing this up so we can label it, we will note that space goes with the i indices left to right, and time goes with the j indices from the top to bottom. So labeling our spaces and times, we have past on the top, present in the middle, and future on the bottom. Time is moving down in this imaginary world. My middle point that is both present and center is y sub i comma j here. I'm using blue to code everything that's in the present, red for the past and green for the future. And let's highlight where these terms occur in the equation. We have our left and right terms here. Our past term is here in the equation. Our future is on the left-hand side, because that is where we're going to store our new information. And then our curvature terms occur in these four locations in the algorithm. This algorithm is called a leapfrog algorithm. This is because of the way, if you had children playing leapfrog on the playground, say, 
the child jumps over the child in front of them, and then the process repeats, skipping over the in-between points. We're going to advance from the red to the green, past the blue, and then what we can do is move our new information backward into the present row of the array, and our present information into the past. Importantly, we want to move the present to the past first so that we don't lose that information by overwriting it with the future. So this gives us a way, once we have an initial set of conditions, to advance them forward in time by computing the curvature and leaping over the middle time step into the future. In the next video, we'll code this up in Python and see how it works and see how it compares to our observation of waves in the physical world.